Welcome to the first lecture for the hybrid microbiology. Um, I want to remind you, if you have not already done it, that these lecture slides <clears throat> are available to you on WebCT. <coughs> Many students of mine in the past have found it helpful to uh, look at those, print them out, and possibly take notes on them while you listen to lectures. So if you haven't done that already, by all means, you can go and get those. They're already available uh, in the same week module that you found the link for this lecture. So to start out with here, one of my favorite quotes of all times in my, uh, regarding microbiology was said in 1967 by the then Surgeon General of the United States. And at that point, he suggested that the end of all infectious diseases was just around the corner. Now that seems so comical to us uh, from our perspective, but in 1967 we have to analyze what was going on to make him think that the end of infectious diseases was just around the corner. Uh, indeed, what was going on, we were at that point in the heyday of antibiotics. Uh, new antibiotics were being created all the time. Uh, antibiotics were a miracle drug that could cure infections that had been deadly up until that point. Um, so that was going on, making them think that they would be able to cure any infection. And of course, vaccine technology was also really hot in the 60s, and it still is, is going today. Uh, but that was really a time when lots of vaccines were being created and produced and studied. Uh, so there was some uh, reasoning behind the statement that, that infectious diseases could be completely conquered um, in, in the 20th century. Now, of course, he was wrong. And why was he wrong? There are several reasons. First, as you no doubt are aware of, there's a huge problem now with antibiotic resistances. Those organisms that we used to be able to kill relatively easily are now becoming resistant to our antibiotics. And in some cases, those infections are deadly once again. Um, of course, there's also always new emerging diseases, diseases that we didn't know about before that are coming out. And uh, HIV is a great example of that. Uh, swine flu is a great example of that, and, and we now understand that there will always be emerging new diseases. They'll, they'll never stop. And of course the other problem is our, our population is aging, uh, and as, they, as we age they are also becoming more immunocompromised, so uh, infections that perhaps weren't as serious before are becoming more serious as our population becomes sort of older, weaker, or more immunocompromised. So, lest you think that uh, microbiology is not useful to you in the healthcare professions, rest assured we will never truly win the war against microbes. It will always be uh, an ongoing battle, them trying to infect and us trying to kill them off. So um, this is a very useful course. I suppose that's where I was headed. All right, so to start out with, what is microbiology? Microbiology is defined as the study of organisms too small to be seen without magnification. That's sort of a strange definition, but indeed we generally think of microbiology as anything that you need a microscope to view. Um, we call those organisms microorganisms. You can shorten that to microbes. Sometimes people use the term germs or bugs. I don't really like those terms. I feel that germs has a negative connotation and in fact most microbes are good for us or perhaps do nothing to us. Uh, and the term bug, um, a bug is something else entirely in biology so that really doesn't uh, work well. So uh, we'll use the term microbes if we're globally talking about microorganisms. Well, you can see here a list of, of common microbes, uh, organisms that would fall under this definition, bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoans, helminths, which are parasitic worms, and algae. These are all different types of microbes. Now, just because they're small is what makes them microbes, but they really are not very similar to one another. They are all very, very different. They have different characteristics, different lifestyles. Um, they're as different from each other as an elephant is from a redwood tree. Right? These are extremely different organisms. In fact, they're more different than an elephant is from a redwood tree. Uh, the only thing they have in common is size. Now if we look at cells on planet Earth, we will find that there are really two different types of cells on the planet. All cells on planet Earth are either prokaryotes or eukaryotes. 
I want to do a little comparison and contrast of prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. Uh, we will use this constantly this semester. I expect that you will know these differences and know them well. So I would suggest making two columns and do a little comparison and contrast here between the two organisms. Um, starting out with a prokaryote. What makes something a prokaryote? A major difference between that prokaryotic cell type and a eukaryotic one. Prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, no membrane-bound nucleus. If I can get my pointer to work here. You can see uh, there's no membrane surrounding the genetic material, so there's no nucleus in a prokaryotic cell. In fact, there's no organelle of any type in this prokaryotic cell. There's no mitochondria, there's no Golgi, nothing like that. There are no organelles in a prokaryotic cell. While we're here, let's define the term organelle. An organelle is a cell component that performs a specific function and is enclosed by a membrane. Organelle is a cell component that performs a specific function and is enclosed by a membrane. Uh, there are no organelles inside of a prokaryotic cell. Of course, there are many inside of the eukaryotic cell. Now, um, as for the genome of the cell, yes, it is DNA, just like other uh, eukaryotic cells, uh, but the prokaryote does carry circular DNA. The DNA is carried in a circular uh, form or a ring. Uh, and they only carry one copy of their genome. That's different than we see in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes also have 70S ribosomes. Uh, ribosomes are not organelles because they are not enclosed by a membrane. All cells have ribosomes because ribosomes are used for uh, protein production. And the type of ribosome that a prokaryotic cell has is called a 70S ribosome. All prokaryotic organisms are unicellular. So everything in a prokaryote, every organism that has a prokaryotic cell is a unicellular organism. Now if we compare this to a eukaryotic cell, eukaryotic cell definitely has a nucleus, right, membrane surrounding its genetic information. In fact, it has other organelles that perform specific functions as well. Um, you'll see that later that the genome inside of the eukaryotic nucleus is a segmented genome. It's an individual pieces. If you think about the human genome, uh, our genome is an individual pieces. It's not a circle like we saw with prokaryotes. And indeed, eukaryotes carry multiple copies of their genome. Um, animals, like humans, usually carry two copies of our genome. Plants can carry multiple copies of their genome. The amount differs, but what's always true is that eukaryotes carry two or more, so multiple copies of their genome. There are, of course, ribosomes in a eukaryotic cell. Again, ribosomes are necessary for protein production. All cells must have ribosomes. The type of ribosome is slightly different in the eukaryote. The eukaryotic ribosome is an 80S ribosome, slightly larger, slightly denser, uh, but actually the job is the same. They work identically. They're very similar to the proc. It's just the size that's different. Now, some eukaryotic organisms are unicellular, some eukaryotic organisms are multicellular. There's some variety there. So I expect that those differences you should have nailed very, very quickly. Um, you should know the difference between a prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell um, right away. That's something that you definitely want to commit to memory um, ASAP. So, if we compare these two different types of cells, again, everything on the planet either is made of prokaryotic cells or it is made of eukaryotic cells. These are two different flavors of cells, if you will. Now, if we look at history, prokaryotic cells are definitely older uh, in Earth's evolutionary timeline than eukaryotic cells. So if we look back here to the probable origin of planet Earth, it was about four billion years before the first uh, life form evolved on the planet, and that life form would have been a prokaryotic cell. So they were definitely the first, a much more simplistic cell structure, and indeed would have evolved first. Prokaryotes were alone on this planet for about two billion years before the first 
eukaryotic cell appeared. Uh, and then again, it took about another billion years or so before the first multicellular life forms evolved. Um, so, and if we're looking at this sort of scale, all of these multicellular eukaryotes uh, evolved relatively recently, and humans evolved like yesterday in evolutionary time. For this reason, uh, when NASA is looking for life on other planets, we're really not expecting to find little green men on Mars. Uh, what they're looking for are single-celled organisms, single-celled simplistic organisms like prokaryotes that we, we think were the original inhabitants of this planet. A word about viruses. Um, viruses are, are very different than other things that we've talked about. I've told you that everything on the planet is either a prokaryote or a eukaryote and its cell structure. Viruses are different. Um, Viruses aren't proc or euc. Now, how can that be if I just said everything was one or the other? Well, viruses aren't a cell at all. They don't have any cell structure. There is no cell structure at all to a virus. Uh, in fact, if we look at what a virus structure is, the virus structure is a protein coat that is called the capsid, and that surrounds its genetic information. And that's the only structure of a virus. So it's a protein coat surrounding genetic information, DNA or RNA. So what, do, what should we call them? Um, there's not a lot of agreement on how we should think of viruses. Some people call them large parasitic molecules. Other people call them primitive acellular organisms. Not a lot of agreement here. What I can tell you without a doubt, what viruses are, they are obligate intracellular parasites obligate intracellular parasites. Let's look at what I mean by that term. Obligate means has to. If you're obligated to go to your mother-in-law's for dinner, you gotta go. Intracellular means inside of the cell. And parasite means that it's relying on a host organism and it's going to damage that host organism. So a virus is an obligate intracellular parasite. It absolutely relies on other cells, uh, and it's parasitizing them from inside that cell. We'll talk a lot more about viruses later, but I just wanted to make the point that they really aren't prokaryotes or eukaryotes. They're a totally different beast. Now, uh, diversity in, in microbes. There is an enormous amount of diversity between microbes. Uh, again, just because they're small doesn't mean that they're very similar to one another. In fact, they are extraordinarily different from one another. A couple of points here. Microbes are ubiquitous. In fact, everywhere we have ever looked for microorganisms, we have found them. Um, we found microbes living deep in, Earth, in the Earth's crust. If you dig down about a mile through solid bedrock, you'll find microbes living down there. Uh, if we take samples from polar ice caps, you find microbes living there in those polar ice caps. Uh, if you take a sample from a geothermal vent, by the way, temperature there would be about 150 degrees Celsius. So a geothermal vent at extreme heat, we find microbes living there. Uh, somebody I worked with at Humboldt State was taking microbial samples from an acidic lake that had a pH of about 1.5, so extremely acidic environments, and there are microbes living there. And of course, microbes live inside and, and on our bodies as well, so they are ubiquitous. Truly, everywhere we look for them, we find them. Now, microbes could either be free-living or parasites. Free living, um, most of them are actually free living. Free living means that they get all of their food sources from the environment. Uh, they don't require any other organisms directly for their food sources. The vast majority of microbes are free living. There are some, however, that are parasites. Uh, we, we talked about parasites a moment ago with viruses, but let's define it. A parasite is an organism that lives on or in a host and damages that host. A parasite is an organism that lives on or in a host and damages that host. There are some that are parasites, um, although most of them are not. Some microbes are photosynthetic. Uh, um, no doubt you know this term, photosynthesis. Uh, as large 
organisms, um, humans, and since we're such large organisms, we tend to think of other large organisms when we think of photosynthesis. In other words, I say photosynthesis, and you think plants and trees and grass. Uh, and sure, they do photosynthesis, but they are not the only ones doing photosynthesis. In fact, over 50% of all photosynthetic behavior is being done by microbes on this planet. Um, there are some bacteria that are photosynthetic, and algae are photosynthetic. So, uh, very, very common reaction in, in microbial life. Uh, let's define photosynthesis while we're here as well. Uh, photosynthesis is a light-derived reaction that makes organic molecules from carbon dioxide. So, it's a light-driven reaction that makes organic molecules from carbon dioxide. So in more simplistic terms, it takes carbon dioxide and it makes sugars. And it uses light energy to do that. That's photosynthesis. Um, microbes could also be unicellular or multicellular. Uh, there is variety there as well. Of course, all of the prokaryotes are unicellular, but the eukaryotes can be multicellular and still be micro microbes, too small to be seen with the naked eye. So there is some um, variety there. Let's look at some different kinds of microbes. I want to just uh, make little lists uh, on the, just the basic characteristics of each of these different types of microbes. We will talk about each one individually in more depth, but this is an opportunity to kind of get the, just the facts um, straight for these different kinds of organisms. So I, I would suggest making little lists for each one. All right, let's look first at your picture A here. Picture A, this is a bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes. They are unicellular always. Some are photosynthetic. So bacteria, prokaryotes, unicellular, some are photosynthetic. Let's compare that to some other types of microbes. Here you're seeing fungus. Uh, fungus are eukaryotes. Uh, if they are unicellular, we would call it a yeast. If they're a multicellular fungus, we would call it a mold. So fungus are always eukaryotes. They could be unicellular, and we would call it a yeast or it could be multicellular and we would call it a mold. Now, they are fungus, absolutely, positively, not photosynthetic. Highlight, underline that. For some reason I don't understand, students get this confused a lot. Fungus are not photosynthetic. They don't do any of that kind of uh, light-driven reaction. How fungus survive instead is they are what we call saprobes, that's S-A-P-R-O-B-E-S. -E they are saprobes, uh, commonly decomposer. You could call it that, too. Um, what they do is they actually uh, digest their food before they bring it into their body structure. Let me say that differently. They excrete enzymes. The enzymes digest those molecules, and then they absorb the nutrients. So they're sort of going through digestion outside of their structure. All right, so we talked about bacteria, which are prokaryotes. We talked about fungus, which are eukaryotes. I want to move down here to picture C. Picture C is a protozoan, P-R-O-T-O-Z-O-A-N. It's a protozoan. protozoan. Protozoans are eukaryotes as well. They are always unicellular. And they ingest their food. They are also not photosynthetic. They ingest their food very similarly to how we do. They ingest it and then digest it. In fact, you can see in this picture this protozoan about to ingest this little food particle. All right, let's look at picture D. Picture D is an algae. Uh, algae are also eukaryotes. Algae can be unicellular or multicellular. Sometimes they do a more complex lifestyle called a colonial lifestyle, but there's lots of variety there, uni, multi, colonial. Um, algae are photosynthetic, absolutely. So you can see he's green here, and he's green because he's using those chlorophyll pigments for photosynthesis. 
Uh, also, another interesting thing about algae, algae are always water associated. Uh, you find them in, in marine environments, you find them in freshwater environments, you find them growing in your shower in a really humid environment, but they're always associated with water. Picture E here. Picture E, these are viruses. This specific example is HIV. Uh, viruses, again, they are not prokaryotes, they are not eukaryotes. The best way to describe them would be to call them obligate intracellular parasites. On their own, they truly are nothing. They're just molecules all collected together. When they have a host cell, however, that's when they're active. So they absolutely require a host cell. They are those obligate intracellular parasites. Now this picture is not labeled. You could label it F in your notes. Um, this is a picture of a helminth, H-E-L-M-I-N-T-H. A helminth is a parasitic worm. Um, parasitic worms are also eukaryotes, and in fact they're in the same kingdom that we, we are. They are multicellular animals. Um, now, sometimes people think to themselves, well, gosh, a multicellular animal, that doesn't sound much like a microbe because microbes are supposed to be too small to be seen with the naked eye. Uh, and in fact, you've probably seen pictures of tapeworms where they're quite long and you think to yourself, does that really qualify as a microbe? You could make a case that sometimes parasitic worms are not microbes. Uh, they are generally covered in a microbiology class for a couple of reasons. First off, they have microscopic stages. Uh, the egg stage, the larval stage are microscopic, and in fact, that's generally when they're diagnosed. So they are diagnosed very similarly to other microbial infections. Um, their lifestyle is very similar in some ways to other microbial pathogens. So we tend to put them into this group. But yeah, you could make a case that they're not truly microbial. Um, just depends on what stage of life they're in. So again, helminths or parasitic worms are eukaryotes and they are multicellular animals. And by their very definition, they're all parasitic. Uh, all of the helminths are parasitic. Now, I'm hoping that I can convince you of the fact that, that most uh, microbes on the planet, in fact, the vast majority of microbes on the planet are actually beneficial. We tend to think of these things as being bad for us, but in fact, most of, us, most of them are doing something very useful. So I want to spend a few minutes just talking about the benefits of microbes on the planet and the things that they're doing for us. First major benefit here, decomposition. Uh, microbes perform a very important function. This is decomposition, the breakdown of dead organic matter into simple molecules. This is absolutely essential. You see in this picture an orange being broken down by fungus, and indeed fungus and bacteria are the major players for decomposition. This is absolutely essential. Imagine if every orange that was ever produced on an orange tree just fell down to the soil and just stayed there. Um, wh why would that be such a bad thing? Well, we would be swimming in oranges, but really even worse would be that those nutrients would never be made available to the soil again, to other life forms. So decomposition is a really important part uh, of soil ecology and ecology in our ecosystems. Um, and it's soil bacteria and soil fungus that's doing that, breaking down those large, huge organic molecules into smaller nutrients and returning those nutrients to the soil. Another benefit that microbes do for us, nutrient production and energy flow. Here you're seeing a pond with a mat of pond scum, which includes mostly green algae growing on the surface there. Now, I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Microbial photosynthesis is actually vital to our environment. Um, in fact, they think that photosynthesis by early bacteria, early bacterial residents on the planet are actually what changed our atmosphere from an anaerobic atmosphere to an aerobic atmosphere. So certainly the only reason that there's life on the planet is photosynthesis due to uh, these algae that were, that were growing, um, or sorry, bacteria that were early residents of the planet. So absolutely, photosynthesis is a huge benefit performed by microbes. Algae do it, some bacteria do it. Over half of the oxygen on the planet actually comes from a microbial cell performing photosynthesis. Uh, so, you know, when you breathe deep today after you get done with this lecture, you can thank a microbe for that, not really the trees. Uh, it's more coming from them.
other nutrient cycles uh, that are, are done by microbes. There are sulfur and nitrogen cycles that, that happen uh, with soil microbes, microbes living in the soil that run this, the sulfur and the nitrogen through and making it available to other organisms. Um, and in fact, even inside of our own bodies, microbes are helping us with nutrient production. Um, microbes assist our digestive tract in digesting food sources. They also are part of our immune system preventing infections. They also produce a number of vitamins there in our gastrointestinal tract that we can't get on our own. So they're doing all sorts of uh, important um, production of nutrients and, and returning those nutrients to the soil in those environments. Production of foods, drugs, and vaccines. Um, absolutely, microbes have been known for a long time and have been used for a long time in the production of various different types of foods. Um, bread, for example, is leavened with yeast, which you now know is a unicellular fungus, indeed a microbe. Um, yogurt, the flavoring that you get in yogurt and cheese also is thanks to bacteria that actually produce those flavors and cause uh, the milk to curdle that way. Wine and beer, if, uh, if this class has driven you to drink <laughs> and you're at the bar having a glass of wine or a beer, you can thank a microbe for that. Yeast uh, cells are doing that fermentation to create the alcohol. In fact, all alcohols are made that way. So if you're driven to taking shots instead of drinking a glass of wine, that's also thanks to those same yeast cells. So all of that stuff is done by microbial cells. Uh, in fact, microbial cells also produce various different types of drugs and vaccines for us now. Um, many of the common antibiotics that we prescribe to patients are actually made by microbial cells in great big vats like you see in this picture. Um, and once they're made in large quantities, it's then refined and uh, used to treat patients. Another really huge benefit of microbes uh, is called bioremediation. Bioremediation is really a hip area of microbe right now. Um, let's define that term. Bioremediation is using biological agents to remedy environmental problems. Bioremediation is using biological agents to remedy environmental problems. For example, uh, so, uh, so bioremediation is when you're using an organism's normal, natural metabolism to fix some environmental problem. For example, let's say that there is, uh, let's say there's an oil spill in, oh, I don't know, how about off the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico? Um, well, once upon a time, the best thing that we could do to fix that problem, to clean up that oil, was to use detergents to literally clean it out of the water, which was catastrophic to the environment. Well, now, one of the many things that, that, that uh, BP and the government have in their arsenal to try and clean up that oil is a bioremediation process. What they do is they take, um, it's like a great big shaker sort of thing, uh, and they have these microbes, these bacteria, and they are, are marine organisms, organisms that live in the ocean, and they naturally digest oil. That's part of their normal metabolism, so it's their favorite food source. And what they do is they sprinkle these microbes all over the surface of the oil. The microbes then digest that oil as part of their normal metabolism. Once they've digested all of the oil, they scoop up the microbes and get rid of them. Wonderful. You're not putting in any sort of extra uh, detergents or chemicals into the water. You're just putting the microbes there and letting them do their normal natural metabolism to clean up the mess. That's an example of bioremediation. Um, in this picture here, you're seeing a bioremediation facility that's on a riverbed. I believe this is in New York State, if I remember correctly. Upstream from this facility is a factory that's releasing various different types of toxins and waste products into the river. The water comes down holding those toxins, and the water circulates through those white tanks that you can see in that picture. You can see those white tanks here in this picture. Um, the water circulates through those, and in those tanks are microbes that are digesting out those toxins. They literally clean out all of the toxins, and clean water is sent out the other side. 
fabulous um, idea, and that's bioremediation, using those organisms' normal metabolism to get rid of an environmental pollutant. Now, in this example, in this figure that we're looking at now, um, in fact, those organisms release methane gas as part of their normal activity. Um, and that facility harnesses that methane gas and actually uses it to heat those tanks to keep the microbes at their favorite temperature. So what I'm telling you is it's totally green, totally off the grid, uh, no outside power is being used to, to drive these reactions, just the normal metabolism of those microbes. That's a great example of bioremediation. Now these are, are many of the benefits uh, that microbes perform for us every day, but unfortunately uh, there are some that are not quite so beneficial. There are some organisms that are what we call pathogens. A pathogen is a disease-causing organism. So a pathogen is a disease-causing organism. You could say something is pathogenic if it's uh, disease causing. You could use it that, that term that way as well. Now while most microbes are actually good for us or possibly don't do anything at all for us, um, there are some that are pathogens or disease causing. About 2,000 different types of microbes have now, have now been identified as pathogens. Um, the numbers are going up as we discover more and more microbes um, and as we discover more diseases caused by microbes that we already knew existed. They're responsible for about 10 billion infections every year worldwide and about 12 million deaths uh, from those infections. Now if we look at the top causes of death um, in the United States and worldwide, we'll see some pathogenic organisms responsible here, some uh, causes of death that are caused by these pathogens. In the United States, for example, influenza and pneumonia, number seven. Um, septicemia, which is a blood infection, is number 10 here. Those are caused by pathogenic organisms. If you look here on, on the worldwide chart, you'll see respiratory infections uh, high on the list. HIV and AIDS, that, that number actually is, is even increasing, so it will move up on the list as well. Diarrheal diseases, unfortunately, um, are deadly to, to many, especially young kids in malnourished parts of the world. Tuberculosis is becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Malaria has been around for an age and is still causing problems. Uh, we are still seeing these numbers going up, unfortunately, even with all of our technology and understanding. Um, why is that? Well, some of it's because, of again, of the aging of our population, um, the presence of HIV and AIDS making our population more immunocompromised, and then also we're just recognizing things better than we used to. So in some ways, it, maybe numbers aren't truly going up, but instead our ability to recognize what's happening is increasing. I want to take us back again. What was microbiology again? The de definition here for microbiology. And, Remember, microbiology is the study of things too small to be seen with the naked eye. So the question is, how small is too small to be seen with the naked eye? This is a little size comparison chart showing you size differences between various different kinds of organisms um, to orient you on, on size comparisons. If you look here, here's a human louse. Um, a human louse is about a millimeter or so in length, that's right about the edge of what a human being can see with the naked eye. So that's right about um, as, as small as you can get and still see it clearly with the naked eye. Um, as we get smaller, of course, here's cellular organisms. You're looking at a red blood cell here. This is a type of algae. Um, in general, eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells, here's a bacteria, here's another bacteria. Right. So in general, the eukaryotic cells are larger, prokaryotic cells are smaller. If we look at around the range for a prokaryotic cell, prokaryotic cells tend to be in the micrometer range. Somewhere between one to five micrometers is a very common size uh, for prokaryotic cells. By the way, a micrometer is 10 to the minus 6 meters, if, that, if you've forgotten that from chemistry. Uh, so to orient, again, eukaryotic cells are larger, 
prokaryotic cells are smaller, viruses are even smaller. Viruses tend to be in the nanometer range. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So viruses are quite a bit smaller than any cellular life form. Now, if you can't see it with your naked eye, well, how are you going to look at it and, and identify it? Well, of course, you're going to use a microscope. So let's talk about the history here of the microscope and the guy responsible for that. This is a very dashing looking man. This is Antony von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch linen merchant. Uh, he, he was uh, selling cloth, linen, a type of cloth. Uh, and because he was a linen merchant, he was very interested in thread count. Just like today, you go to buy your sheets and they want to know about thread count. That indicates the quality of the fabric in your sheets. He was interested in thread count uh, in order to look at the quality of his linen. So he created these, um, these early microscopes, these lens systems, to help him view the quality of the linen. And he was looking at thread count. Well, eventually he got really, really good with his lens systems and he was able to not only see thread count, but he began to become interested in the organisms, the tiny little organisms he saw on the surface of those threads. Uh, once he identified that they were there, he started looking for them in other samples. He looked at pond water samples and he saw these organisms. He scraped his teeth, the plaque off of his teeth, and looked at those organisms from that sample. Um, this is the late 1600s, so he found somebody who had never brushed their teeth. Not uncommon in the late 1600s. Uh, he took his sample from their teeth and examined it under the, the scope and, and he saw all sorts of different organisms, these teeny tiny little cellular life forms. He called them animacules, which is a great name. I don't know why we changed it. I think it's a fabulous name. But at any rate, uh, Leeuwenhoek saw these little animacules and he was the first person to see this cellular life. Um, he described things like the water seeming to be alive with life forms. Um, he did report his findings to the Royal Society of London, identifying these tiny little animacules, and so we often think of him as the father of microbiology because he was the first person to see um, cellular life forms and microbes. Now, his, his microscope, by the way, was a, capable of magnifying up to 300 times, which is really quite extraordinary for the time in which he was living. Remember that the best uh, visible light microscopes that we have even today only go up to a thousand times. So he was really uh, doing a, an unbelievable job with his little single lens uh, lens systems. So here's a picture of the early microscope that he was using. You can see the specimen here goes on the tip of this structure. You can then uh, move things up and down here. You can also move it in and out to focus it. You look through the lens. Here's Mary, our lab technician, demonstrating how this would work. Uh, and of course, as your light source, you're using a candle or the sun as a light source. Here's some pictures of figures he drew. Um, it's interesting, they go back now and they look through these, uh, knowing the samples that he was examining, we can identify many of these organisms. Um, and in fact, he not only drew out these pictures and his papers, he also documented movement. Notice this, he was documenting the motion of this organism. Really uh, considerable work for that time frame. Now the next big major event in the history of microbiology here would be ending the debate over a topic called spontaneous generation. Now, spontaneous generation, this was a theory that existed um, all the way up until 1860s. Uh, and spontaneous generation was the idea, it was an ancient belief, uh, and it was the idea that living things could arise from non-living things. Uh, that was the idea behind spontaneous generation. Living things could arise from non-living things. Uh, and people who believed in spontaneous generation talked about what they called the vital force. And this uh, mysterious vital force is what created this sort of spark of life. Um, 
and, and that vital force was floating around in the atmosphere and could come in and cause this spark of life, allowing spontaneous generation. And in fact, if you look back at the literature during this time period, the scientific literature, it's really hilarious. I think one of my favorite all-time papers was a paper from the, uh, it was the late 1700s, and it was describing how to make mice. If you wanted to make mice and, and you took um, you took hay and you took socks that had been worn for three or four days without washing them, you mix those together, you poured beef broth over them, and then you put them in the barn overnight and that would magically make mice. You know, um, It's really funny to, to look back over those papers, but people really believed this. They believed that uh, things you could create life as long as the vital force, this mojo that was floating in the atmosphere, could have access to your subject. Now the man who, who disproved this um, was a debate at the time, and Louis Pasteur is the man who uh, eventually disproved this in 1861. Now, Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur was interested in the wine industry and uh, food industries. That's, that's how he got interested in early microbiology. Louis Pasteur was aware of the work done by Lewin Hook, and he was the one that kind of thought to himself, hmm, I wonder if Lewin Hook's animacules are going to help me end this debate. Um, and he eventually is going to demonstrate that microbes are present in the air. The first experiment that he did. Um, imagine, if you will, he had two containers of nutrient broth. Nutrient broth is basically like a chicken stock or a beef stock solution. Lots of nutrients in there, lots of things would love to grow in that environment. So he had two containers here of nutrient broth uh, in a flask. He heated both of them up till everything inside of it was dead. One of them he sealed closed after it was heated. The other one he left open and did not seal closed. He let them sit, and sure enough, the one that was open had growth in it. The one that was closed had no growth in it. So Louis Pasteur said, see, what happened is the one that was closed didn't allow these, these animacules in the air to grow because it was closed. This one was open, and therefore the animacules fell, fell out of the air into it, into the container, and it grew. That's what Louis Pasteur said. Um, now, the people who believe in spontaneous generation said, no, no, no. What happened here is you sealed this, this flask closed so the vital force couldn't get in there and allow this spark of life to begin. So he had to come up with a new experiment. And the experiment he came up with was really very clever and very smart. Uh, one of the kind of quintessential experiments um, of all time, really. Uh, what he did is he created these S-shaped flasks, or sometimes called swan-necked flasks. What he did is he had, again, two containers of nutrient broth here. Right? He heated them both up till everything was dead inside of them. And he heated up the glass and created this really severe curved structure in the neck. Look at the picture here on the right, and you can see uh, the flask, it was heated, the glass was then bent into this really severe structure. Right? Now, it is totally open, and indeed air can pass throughout this, this entire uh, neck of the flask. It's just really severely bent. So again, two flasks heated up entirely until everything could be dead inside of them. Um, both of them have this swan neck to it. One of them he broke open, and one of them he left closed. Well, the one that he broke open, of course, it grew stuff. Things fell out of the air, and indeed, it grew microbes in it. The one that he left open, however, while the air and the so-called vital force would be able to get in through that opening, microbes, because of gravity, were not capable of getting up and into that flask. They could not go all the way up and down into that flask. So in fact, it stayed sterile. Um, this was a quintessential experiment where the swan neck flask allowed the vital force to come in, but did not allow the microbes to come in. And indeed, nothing grew in it. So Louis Pasteur said, 
See, it's open to your nonsense vital force, but these little organisms in the air can't get in there. And so in fact, life would be coming from those little organisms, not from your vital force. And this was kind of the undeniable evidence. This proved the antithesis of spontaneous generation called biogenesis. Biogenesis is the idea that only life can beget life. So you must have a life form in order to have life there. Um, this was a hugely important experiment, and in fact, this experiment was done um, in 1861, and to this day, his swan neck flasks are still sterile. Uh, so that's been quite a while. They did seal them closed in the 1950s because they didn't want the liquid to evaporate and wanted to keep it for posterity. So they have been sealed, but still that's uh, almost 100 years of sterile conditions. Very good by anybody's estimation. By the way, you can see these flasks at the Pasteur Institute in Paris, um, which I did go and see these flasks, you know, just, just so I could be an effective teacher. That would be the only reason that I went to Paris. But anyway, so Louis Pasteur, one of his big commitments here, one of his big um, donations to microbiology is this theory of biogenesis. Now, Louis Pasteur, we will see his name over and over again. Uh, he had his hands in all of the early work of microbiology. This is one big component of what he did, but he did all sorts of other things. Um, and Louis Pasteur was really rather full of himself. Um, he, he thought himself quite clever in, in the work that he had done. And, and I have a quote here from his notebook. When he uh, completed this experiment, he wrote in his science notebook, For I have kept from them and am still keeping from them that one thing that is above the power of man to make, I have kept from them the germs that float in the air. I have kept life from them. So uh, he, he, he was quite a guy, really uh, very aware of, of just how important he was, let me tell you. So Louis Pasteur here, if we look at some of the contributions of Louis Pasteur, he disproved spontaneous generation of microbes. Um, he was showing that the theory of biogenesis was true. Um, now, again, he came to the field of microbiology from, uh, from the wine and cheese industry. So he looked at these, these experiments and began to think that microbes could cause food fermentation and spoilage. And indeed, he did a lot of work with that. That's where we get the, the uh, whole theory of pasteurization. Um, he developed that as a way to kill off microbes in liquids. Uh, he was very, very... Um, active in early microbiology. Louis Pasteur also developed a rabies vaccine through a whole series of horrific experiments with a lot of dead rabbits, but uh, a big contribution in vaccine technology as well. So in this class, in microbiology in general, um, if in doubt, if you don't know who did that experiment, just sort of just say Louis Pasteur. That's kind of the safe bet. Uh, he, he really had his hand in all sorts of different areas of early microbiology. Now the next guy I want to talk about who really had a huge component in early microbiology, especially medical microbiology, is a guy named Joseph Lister. Uh, Joseph Lister was an English surgeon um, and he, he had a lot to do with early medical microbiology, but before we talk about him, I need to tell you uh, about one other guy that Joseph Lister knew about, and Joseph Lister used that uh, knowledge in his work as well. A guy named Semmelweis. Semmelweis ran a hospital in, I believe it was Austria, if I remember correctly, uh, and Semmelweis had this... Um, really awful situation. He was aware of the fact, just by looking at statistics, he knew that if women gave birth in his hospital, they were more likely to die of infection than if they stayed home and gave birth at home. That's what Semmelweis figured out. Well, obviously that's not what our goal is in medicine, so uh, he began to pay attention to various different things to figure out what was going on, and what he realized is if the medical students went to the morgue before they went to deliver babies, the women died of infections. But if the medical students instead delivered babies first and went to the morgue later, the women didn't die of infections. Now, mind you, nobody knows that washing their hands is important. They're not doing anything like that, right? 
Um, now, he didn't really know why. He didn't have theories on what was going on. But he did realize this pattern that it was safer for the women if the medical students delivered babies first and went to the morgue later. And so that was what he had his students do. He had his students rotate that direction. Again, not realizing why it was important. Lister's the one that really puts it together. So Joseph Lister, this English surgeon, he knew about Semmelweis's work at his hospital. Um, and he took that knowledge and he took the knowledge that Louis Pasteur had shown with food contamination and food spoilage. Louis Pasteur had proven that microbes could cause this food uh, spoilage and fermentation. So Lister said, all right, well, maybe these same microbes that Louis Pasteur is attributing to fermentation and spoilage, maybe they can also cause disease in humans. That's called the germ theory of disease. The germ theory of disease is the idea that microbes can cause disease. Now, Lister was a huge um, part of developing this, but to be fair, Lister and Pasteur did it together. So this is really Louis Pasteur and Joseph Lister together coming up with this germ theory of disease. Now, because of his belief that microbes could cause disease, he did introduce aseptic techniques. Um, he would have his surgeons uh, scrub all the way up to their elbows in phenol. Phenol is also called carbolic acid. Imagine what that felt like. Uh, so he would have his surgeons scrub all the way up to their elbows with carbolic acid. He would have the patients scrub with carbolic acid before their surgeries. Um, he was using these early aseptic techniques and aseptic surgery to prevent infection and indeed his infection rates plummeted. He had the lowest infection rates of anybody in Europe and indeed that's when people started to pay attention and started to mimic his techniques. So he was the first person that used hand washing and chemical treatments to prevent infection. In fact, phenol, what he was using early on in his experiments, is still used to kill off microbes today. Um, not only phenol, but derivatives of phenol. Uh, there is a common household item that you may have in your medicine cabinet right now that is also made of a derivative from that phenol that he was using. And it was uh, actually named in honor of Joseph Lister. Um, that would be Listerine, the mouthwatch, uh, named after Joseph Lister because it does have a derivative of phenol in it. All right. The last uh, topic that I want to get to in this introductory lecture, I want to talk about evolution. Um, evolution really is is a topic that's ingrained in all parts of biology. Uh, I don't know how you could go through any biological science class without discussing evolution, um, even if it's in the background. But it's especially true in a microbiology class because these organisms are so small and they have such a fast um, lifespan, such a short lifespan, they really evolve very quickly. So evolution is extremely important in a microbiology class. Um, I really want to make sure we're all on the same page. Unfortunately, in the popular press, evolution is, is not used correctly. The term isn't used correctly. People don't understand what evolution really means. So I just want to go through it and make sure that we're all on the same page on what I mean by evolution and how that works. So evolution. Evolution is the idea that living things change gradually over millions of years. Um, it's, uh, again, change in the population over millions of years. Uh, the process of natural selection is one major force of, in evolution. Uh, and natural selection is the idea that changes favoring survival are retained, less beneficial changes are lost. For example, imagine if there is a population of crickets. And let's say that the crickets are living on a white floor. Now, if the crickets are living on a white floor, now we, uh, first off, we're going to see lots of variety. Every population has variety in it. Some crickets will be larger, some crickets will be smaller, some crickets will be lighter, some crickets will be darker. You're going to see natural variation. Um, now let's add a selective pressure. I'm the selective pressure. I hate crickets, and every time I see a cricket, I'm going to step on it and kill it. Now, on my white floor, if there's a population of crickets on the white floor that I'm stepping on and killing, which ones am I most likely to step on and kill? Well, I'm more likely to step on large, 
dark colored crickets because I can see them more clearly. Therefore, I'm effectively killing off larger, darker crickets. So what crickets survive to make cricket babies? Small, light colored crickets are going to survive. Therefore, the next generation of crickets are going to be smaller and lighter. If this goes on for multiple generations, the entire population becomes smaller and whiter. Right? Individual crickets become smaller and whiter as they're trying to survive in that environment. So changes favoring survival are retained, less beneficial changes are lost. Now evolution is a process that happens to a population, not to an individual. For example, no one cricket is going to all of a sudden become lighter and smaller because it sees that the big dark ones are dying. It's not how it works. It's the luck of the draw. Uh, it's just that the, those that happen to have the best traits survive. Right? So individuals do not evolve. Populations evolve. That's natural selection. Now, all new species originate from pre-existing species over time. Eventually, you get a new species because they have evolved better to their environment and they're, in, they're separated from earlier species. Closely related organisms have similar features because they have evolved from common ancestral forms. So the reason that um, two, or, two organisms have similar features is because they have a common ancestor that's not very long ago in evolutionary time. In general, evolution progresses towards greater complexity. Um, more complex organisms are, are newer in the evolutionary process. More simplistic organisms tend to be older in the evolutionary process. We evolve more complexity over time. Now we can look at relationships, both evolutionary relationships um, as well as genetic relationships between organisms. Let's look on the left hand side here and think about a wolf versus a leopard versus a domestic cat. Just looking at them, which one do you think that leopard has more DNA in common with? Does the leopard have more DNA in common with a wolf or does the leopard have more DNA in common with a domestic cat? Now as you're looking at it, probably you're saying, mm, the leopard probably has more DNA in common with a cat. And in fact, probably they have a more recent ancestor because they have more DNA in common. Uh, and indeed, you are right. Leopards do have more DNA in common with cats. Now, how did you do that? Probably you're using external factors to determine that. You're looking at body structure. Right. You're looking at hunting styles. They're both single individual hunters while wolves are pack animals. You're looking at digestive uh, digestion. You're looking at body structure and physiology, all those sorts of things to identify that they have more similarity than, than they do to the wolf. Well, it turns out that if we compare their DNA, we can see the exact same thing, not just by looking at their outward appearance, but if we compare their DNA, we see the same idea. We see that the leopard and the cat have more DNA in common than either of them has with a wolf. What you're looking at here is called a phylogenetic, oops, phylogenetic tree. Uh, I don't know where my note went that I have on down here at the bottom. Uh, what you're looking at is a phylogenetic tree. A, a phylogenetic, phylogenetic tree uh, shows relationships between organisms uh, based on both their DNA and their evolutionary history. So it's comparing the DNA sequence as well as evolutionary history to link organisms together. Here's how to read a phylogenetic tree. Um, these two organisms, the cat and the leopard, they have more DNA in common with one another than they do with the wolf. So you're seeing this link here. This organism here at this fork would be a common ancestor that went on to evolve in both to the leopard and to the cat. You have to go further back in evolutionary time to find a common ancestor between the wolf and either the leopard or the cat. So as you move down, you're looking back in evolutionary time. That's how you read a phylogenetic tree. So this is an older link. This is a newer link.
Now we can use this same idea to link other animals. Here's a phylogenetic tree linking lots of different kinds of animals. As you look at them, you can see how closely related organisms are. Um, you can tell that the rat and the mouse are very closely related. That common ancestor is not very far away. The mouse and the fish are distantly related. Their common ancestor is all the way down here. So you can identify how how closely their DNA sequence will match as well as um, how far back in evolutionary time you have to go before you find a common ancestor between them. Now using this technique you could link the DNA of all organisms on the planet. You could link all uh, life forms on planet Earth. And if you do that, this is a kind of a very basic tree, very basic phylogenetic tree, you see all of the different kinds of eukaryotes here, fungus, animal, algae, plants, protozoans, you know, they have something in common because they all are eukaryotes. But what you'll see very surprisingly is that there are two different kinds of prokaryotes. I've talked about cells as being prokes or eukes, but if you look at this, there's this type of prokaryote that are different from this type of prokaryote. So when scientists did this, when they compare all of the DNA from all of these organisms, they discovered that there are actually three fundamentally different types of organisms on planet Earth. In fact, it appears that there are three different branches or cell lines that develop during evolution, each one being very different from one another according to both their DNA and their evolutionary history. There are two different kinds of prokaryotes. You can't just say proc and euk because there's this kind of prokaryote and this kind of prokaryote that are very different from one another. So because of this, um, they had to change how we classify organisms on the planet and the new classification system is called the three domain taxonomy. All organisms on the planet fall under one of three different domains of life. And these are the three domains. First is domain bacteria. Officially its name is domain eubacteria, but you can just use the term bacteria. These, uh, in this domain, these organisms are all true bacteria. They have a substance called peptidoglycan in their cell wall. There is another domain of prokaryotes. That is this domain here, archaea. Archaea are prokaryotes also. They do not have peptidoglycan in their cell wall, never. And in fact, the archaea tend to be what we call extremophiles. They tend to be living in very unusual extreme environments. They're organisms that are living in a very hot environment like a geothermal vent. They're organisms that are living in an extremely acidic environment or high salt environment, an extreme environment. Those tend to be the archaea. In fact, we don't know a whole bunch about archaea. Um, we know that they exist, but they're very difficult to study because of the kinds of places that they live. We don't know of any that cause infections in humans. Um, we just, we don't know a lot about them. They're very difficult to study, so stay tuned. We're still figuring our archaea out. Everything else on the planet falls under this domain called eukarya. So anything that is a eukaryote in its cell structure falls under the domain eukarya. They have a nucleus, they have organelles, they have ADS ribosomes, they have multiple copies of their genome, all of the things that we associate with eukaryote. So really three different domains, bacteria, eukarya, and archaea. Here's a phylogenetic tree showing uh, the genetic and evolutionary relationships between all of Earth's inhabitants. If we look at domain level here, uh, the first organism on the planet at the bottom of our phylogenetic tree eventually split here, it's a prokaryote, split here and went off this direction to form the domain bacteria. And then it went this direction, branched again to form the domain archaea, and of course eventually evolved into this domain eukarya, where all of those organisms uh, that are eukaryotes fall. Now as we look at this again, um, it's not enough to say proc or euk because both organisms in the domain bacteria and organisms in the domain archaea are prokaryote in their structure. Um, they're, but they're very different if we look at their DNA sequence. So looking at this, I have a question for you. Think to yourself, 
Uh, if you were to compare a uh, extremophile, if you were to compare one of those archaeal organisms that live in the geothermal vents, right? One of these really unusual prokaryotes that live in the geothermal vents. Compare him to bacteria and compare him to a human. Does that organism have more DNA in common with a human? Or does that organism have more DNA in common with a bacteria? Think it out for a moment. Now, in fact, I'm hoping, looking at that phylogenetic tree, that you realize that indeed this organism that lives in extreme heat, this really extreme archaeal organism, has more DNA in common with a human than it does with bacteria. And you know that by looking at this tree, if you compare him, he has a common link to you here in eukarya. You have to go back further to find a common link with bacteria. So in fact, archaea has more DNA in common with you and other eukaryotes than it does with bacteria. That's why they had to go back and say three domains. It's not enough to say proc and euc. There are two fundamentally different kinds of prokaryotes, the bacteria and the archaea. And the archaea actually have a common ancestor to you and other eukaryotes. So really, really um, groundbreaking information when that came out, um, splitting up these, these prokaryotes into two groups. Now, below the domain level, Below the domain level are, are the, is the system you probably have learned before. Um, after you go through domain, then you go to kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. That's going from the most broad to the most narrow in a classification system. If you've never had to learn this classification system before, I can teach you a sentence that will help you to remember it. Uh, if you take the first letter for all of these here, right, D, K, P, C, O, uh, if you take the first letter for each of these, you can spell out a sentence. Uh, did King Philip come over for good soup. I'll say it again. Did King Philip come over for good soup? So if we, this example is looking at uh, classification of an American black bear. Of course the domain is eukarya here. That domain includes all of the eukaryotes. It includes fungus, it includes algae and protozoans and plants. Um, it's in the kingdom Animalia in the phylum Chordata, class Mammalia, order Carnivora, family Uricidae, genus Ursus, and species Ursus Americanus. And so you can go from very broad to very narrow. A common way for me to ask this sort of question. If two organisms are in the same family, are they also in the same phylum? two organisms are in the same family, are they also in the same phylum? And the answer is yes. Family is a smaller group, so if they happen to be in the same family, they're also going to be in the same phylum, right? So think of another one. If two organisms are in the same class, are they also in the same genus? Two organisms are in the same class, are they also in the same genus? Not necessarily. For example, the black bear is in the same class as a dolphin, but they're not in the same genus. So that's one way to ask those questions, knowing the levels of organization. Another thing I want to mention here, um, sometimes they don't use the term phylum, instead they use the term division. Um, in plants and algae and fungus, sometimes you see the term division instead of phylum. That's the same level of classification system. I don't know why they can't play nice and use the term phylum like everybody else, but they don't. Uh, so a phylum equals a division, a division equals a phylum.
When we name microorganisms, we use the same system that's used to name other macroorganisms. It's the binomial or scientific nomenclature. Uh, in this nomenclature, each microbe has two names. We, we give both its genus as well as its species. The genus is always capitalized. The species is always lowercase. And since it is a specific name, we would italicize it. And if you can't italicize it, then you would underline it to indicate that it is italicized. So for example, the microbe Staphylococcus aureus, Staphylococcus is the genus, aureus is the species. For Bacillus subtilis, Bacillus is the genus, and subtilis is the species. Escherichia coli, Escherichia is the genus, coli is the species. Now after you have spelled it out once, you can then shorten it. You can have just the um, first letter of the genus and then the species. So after you write out Staphylococcus aureus the first time, from then on you can call it S. aureus or B. subtilis or E. coli to shorten it. But you do need to spell it out the first time uh, so that everybody knows what organism you're talking about. All right, that's the end of the introductory lecture. Um, next lecture would be the methods lecture, so look for that, and I will see you next time. Uh, feel free to uh, web CT me any questions or get on the discussion board to ask questions as well. All right, see you guys soon.